Today's video is brought to you by our friends over at Squarespace from websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics. Squarespace is the all in one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Check them out through the link below. More on them in a bit. It sounds like something from science fiction, a plot to explore an alien ocean hidden beneath the surface of a world hundreds of millions of kilometers away. The plot that involves first tunneling through a 25 kilometer thick ice sheet before releasing a swarm of robot submarines. Is that out loud like that? It sounds not just fictional, it sounds frankly pretty damn impossible, like something dreamed up by stoned MIT engineers between their bong hits. Yet there's nothing fictional about any of it. Right now, scientists are developing these concepts for a future space mission, a mission that they think could be a mere 20 years away. The mission that could lead to humanity's first encounter with extraterrestrial life. In today's mega projects, we're delving deep into the ideas and challenges behind cryobots and autonomous swimming robots, and we're asking if we really will see such an ambitious mission within our lifetimes. Millions of kilometers away from our pale blue dot lie two of the most fascinating moons in the entire solar system. Europa and Enceladus are both small icy worlds orbiting gas giants. In Europa's case, it spins around the king of the planets, Jupiter. Enceladus, meanwhile, clings close to mighty Saturn. But while they may have different hosts, both remote moons have two very important things in common. The first is that both are home to subsurface oceans, globe-spanning seas of salty liquid water hidden beneath the crust of ice. Now, this is unusual, but it's not super rare. The moons Ganymede, Titan, Triton, and potentially Callisto also hide liquid oceans beneath their exteriors, as might the dwarf planets Pluto and Ceres. What sets Enceladus and Europa apart, though? is the second important thing about them. Unlike all other ocean worlds, their layer of liquid water is thought to start relatively near the surface. The global European ice sheet is thought to be only 25 kilometers thick. Enceladus may have ice a mere five kilometers thick at its poles. And that means that we might one day be able to tunnel through this ice and explore them. Exactly how humans would go about getting through so much ice and investigating these lightless seas is the real meat of today's episode. But before we dive into all of the awesome engineering, we need to take a minute to outline why we might want to. And the answer is, well, because there could be life down there. Despite being smaller than our moon, both Europa and Enceladus are thought to contain enormous volumes of liquid water. In Europa's case, it's more than all of Earth's oceans combined. And this is exciting because where we find water on Earth, we tend to find life. Especially when that water is in contact with mineral-rich rocks. Especially when it has also got a heat source. In Europa's case, that heat source comes from a process known as tidal heating. As the moon travels in orbit around Jupiter, it interacts with the gravity of two other large satellites, Io and Ganymede. This creates an odd effect whereby Europa is repeatedly pulled in one direction by its siblings and in another direction by its host planet, a cosmic tug of war that is so powerful that it literally stretches Europa's skin. This creates friction, which leads to internal heating. In turn, this not only keeps the ocean liquid, but also likely leads to hydrothermal vents, chimneys on the sea floor where water interacts with a hot rock, creating a chemical-rich stew that's perfect for life. Here on Earth, hydrothermal vents are usually swarming with creatures, creatures supported not by a food chain that relies on energy from the sun, but by one relying on those same chemical reactions. This is why astrobiologists think that Europa or Enceladus represent our best chance of finding alien life. Europa's ocean, in particular, is thought to have been stable for billions of years, plenty of time for microbes or even potentially complex creatures to have evolved. It's also why one of the most exciting upcoming NASA missions is the Europa Clipper, a probe that we've covered in a separate video that will soon conduct multiple flybys of the Jovian moon. But awesome as the Clipper is, it's not an upcoming mission that we're here to discuss today, but rather a hypothetical one. As part of the planning for what comes after Clipper, NASA has sent up an entire department. Known as the Scientific Exploration Subsurface Access Mechanism for Europa, or SESAMI for short, it has one of the coolest tasks in all of science to figure out how we get down to that hidden ocean. How to hunt for signs of life deep below the surface 
of a hostile world so far away. And the coolest part is, we've already got the answers. Way back in the 1950s, scientists began working on probes that could tunnel deep into ice sheets. Known as melt probes, they were initially designed for work in Antarctica. By the 1960s, they were capable of boring down to a depth of one kilometer or over half a mile for those who prefer units that function like Harry Potter money. Now, it's from these melt probes that today's cryobots are descended, souped up modern versions that will one day be used in space. So, now would be a good time to explain well, exactly what these things are. At their simplest, melt probes work on something sometimes called the hot penny principle. Imagine taking a penny and heating it up to a high temperature and then placing it on top of an ice cube. You can imagine what happens next. The ice melts as gravity pulls the penny down, creating a tunnel. Now, of course, melt probes are more sophisticated than hot pennies, requiring an energy source in order to keep them warm. Now, normally this comes in the form of a generator sat on the surface, feeding copper wire down into the probe. Because the wires are poor conductors, they create a lot of heat, and this keeps the body of the probe warm enough to keep melting the ice. Now, that's just the classic model. Newer models use fiber optic cables to send lasers from the surface, which zap metal plates inside the probe to provide the heat. Still, the principle is the same. A long rocket-shaped instrument pointing tip downwards using mostly heat and gravity to do the tunneling. And note the key word here, though, mostly. And this is because melt probes often come with add-on features to ensure that the journey goes smoothly. Features like water jetting. Even on Earth, melt probes tunneling through an ice sheet might encounter little rocks that get in the way and impede their passage toward Hades. Water jetting helps clear the way by sucking in all of the melt water around the probe, heating it up, and blasting it out in front in powerful streams. Other cryobots come with cutting tools that can take over and slice through layers of stone that would otherwise be impossible to melt. And again, all of this is real technology that currently exists. In fact, it existed for over half a century. And that means uh, we've had decades to prepare to use it on an alien world. It was in the late 1990s that the Galileo spacecraft confirmed the existence of Europa's subsurface ocean. Since then, scientists have been working flat out to create a cryobot that could one day take us down to see it. The Jet Propulsion Laboratory, for example, is currently developing the 360-kilogram probe using radioisotopes for icy moons exploration, or PRIME. The private company Stone Aerospace has already built and tested its own cryobot called Valkyrie. Just this year, NASA signed off on a project called Orca, which will field test this technology by sending a melt probe tunneling through one kilometer of Alaska's Juneau ice field into a subglacial lake. So, now that we've got our heads around what a regular cryobot looks like, let's turn our attention to the next stage. All right, let me interrupt today's video for just a brief moment because it's time for a word from today's excellent sponsor, Squarespace. Look, the internet can be an overwhelming place. You might need a website for something, I don't know. You got a business or a blog or an idea, whatever you want to get out there. And you'll be like, how do I do this? What is HTML? I'm so confused. Well, don't be confused. Squarespace is where you must go to build that website because they make everything super easy. You go over to Squarespace and you say, make a website. I'm simplifying it a little bit, but it is very simple. And then they're like, tell us what you do. And you're like, well, I do this and I do that. And Squarespace are like, well, here are some templates that you might like. And you're like, I like that one. You click on it, you load it up, you customize it, you take out that Laura Nipson and you put in like, hello, I'm Simon, I'm a YouTuber. Whatever, you know, you do you. You throw in a picture of yourself and you're kind of good to go. You can add in a contact form or whatever, like whatever you need for your business, or I don't know, if you're a photographer or I don't know, do something in design, like you throw up like your portfolio or whatever. And I say throw up like super casually because it is just like click, boom, upload, done. But also look, if you want to customize it, make it like super specific for you, you can also do that with Squarespace. And they've also got loads of other features. Like one that I always mention is I used to pay like, oh, it was like a hundred and something dollars a month for a mailing list. And then Squarespace are like, oh no, we do that as well. And it's included in the price. You're like, okay, fantastic. Go to squarespace.com slash megaprojects to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. Again, squarespace.com slash megaprojects. There's a link below in case you're lazy and don't want to type it out. And now back to today's video.
The big problem with sending a cryobot tunneling to Europa's hidden ocean is the sheer thickness of the surface ice. We mentioned earlier that the layer is thought to stretch to 25 kilometers, but that's really just an educated guess. It could be as little as 10 kilometers or as many as 40 kilometers. At the higher end, that would mean any melt probe would need a power source that can sustain it on a journey of well over two years. Obviously, just running a diesel generator at the surface is not going to cut it. Instead, the heating source will likely have to be nuclear. In the long term, the goal is to create nuclear fission reactors that could be deposited on the European surface and feed energy down to the craft through cables. But this technology is so far in the future, those working on Prime at JPL have come up with a way to power a much sooner mission. Radioisotope thermoelectric generators. Plutonium-238 is a fun substance. As it decays, it generates heat, meaning a block of it will get hot just as it sits there. The heat from this can be used to generate electricity, which is what keeps Mars rovers like Perseverance alive. But it could also be used to provide a multi-year heat source for a melt probe. That means the seemingly hard part, how to power a cryobot so far from home, is actually pretty easy. But it isn't the only issue. There's also communication. On Earth, you could keep the tunnel a cryobot bores open by pouring in alcohol. On Europa, though, uh, it's going to be no handy cosmonaut waving a bottle of half-drunk vodka about. As a result, we have to expect that any tunnel dug will refreeze solid behind the melt probe. Now, in a perfect environment, this wouldn't be a problem. Fiber optic cables are incredibly strong these days, strong enough to withstand being encased in ice. In a perfect world, you'd just attach a super long one to a cryobot and use it for communication. But Europa isn't a perfect world. It's a world constantly pulled out of shape by the cosmic tug of war between Jupiter and the other moons. The place of frightening geological activity. Any cable, therefore, would have to survive not just being frozen, but also being pulled and stretched as the ice it was encased in shifted over multiple years. Hence the need for backup wireless communication. The idea is that, as it tunneled, the melt probe would periodically release little transponders that would freeze into the ice behind it. Eventually, you'd have a chain of about a dozen dotted all the way down. If the probe were to send any information without the cable, it could send it to the lowest transponder, which would pass it to the next lowest, and so on and so forth. Impressively, this could be done either using wireless technology like we have on Earth, or by using acoustic waves, physical vibrations that would travel up through the ice carrying information. And there would certainly be a lot of data to relay. During its descent, the probe wouldn't just concentrate on tunneling, it would also conduct research into the ice, for example by analyzing the meltwater for signs of microbes. Still, even with the transponders, getting enough data back to the surface to be beamed to Earth might be hard. One of the lead researchers on Orca, Dr. Samuel Howell, explains in an interview that a really thick ice sheet might result in only 100 bits a second being communicated. That's so slow it'd make your first 1990s dial-up connection look like Starlink. If we want to prevent that from happening, we'll need some serious advances in data compression. For now, though, let's imagine the melt probe is able to keep up a decent connection as it plunges through the ice, right the way through to the awe-inspiring, literally groundbreaking day when it smashes through the last layer and plunges into the alien ocean. What happens next? Well, it could just float there, sampling the water. Europa is thought to have extremely strong currents, meaning the probe might be lucky enough to have some interesting material swept into its sensors just as it stays still. But what if we don't want it to stay still? What if we're worried that it might have popped up into one place devoid of any funky space dolphins and we needed to travel around just to be sure? Sadly, the cryobot itself isn't going to help us. Designing it to be streamlined enough to get through the ice means that it would have limited mobility in an ocean environment, even if it wasn't tethered by a fiber optic cable. Instead, we're going to need something much stranger and something much more exciting. And yes, you guessed it, it's finally time we talk about the thing that we promised we would talk about in the introduction, and that is, of course, robot submarines. <laughs> Ethan Shaler is a guy with a fascinating job. Just this year, the JPL micro-robotics expert received $600,000 phase two funding from NASA to further study his wild idea to build a swarm of autonomous robot submarines. Known as Sensing with Independent Micro Swimmers, or SWIM for short, the concept was born from Shaler and his team chucking around ideas for giving a cryobot extra mobility. In the end, though, it became clear that the best way to explore would be to pack the cryobot itself with dozens of swimming robots 
each the size of a cell phone. And that tiny size is important. Because it needs to be streamlined to make it below the surface, the Europa Melt Probe will only have a limited space on board, most of which will be reserved for scientific instruments. Shaler & Co.'s genius was to design robots that are a mere 12 centimeters or 5 inches long and extremely thin. By cramming them one atop another, they calculate that they could fit 48 of these little buggers inside the cryobot, equivalent to just 15% of all the space put aside for scientific instruments. And the best part? Even that wouldn't be wasted. Each micro-swimmer would carry its own set of tiny instruments. Nothing too fancy, just simple stuff designed to do simple but revealing things like monitor temperature, acidity, and pressure. Simple things like check for chemicals that might indicate life. The current plan envisages the cryobot unleashing a first wave of micro-swimmers not long after reaching Europa's ocean. The robots would motor away from the burning hot melt probe to take measurements, each with an onboard battery capable of lasting up to three hours. Now, this isn't much, certainly nowhere near long enough for a micro-swimmer to go explore the hydrothermal vents of the ocean floor. But it is, hopefully, as long as it needs to be. While hydrothermal vents are the best bet for finding life, we know from experience on Earth that there's another place creatures in icy seas like to gather at the point where the bottom of the ice shelf meets the water. Known to clever people as the ice-water interface, it could well be swimming with bacteria. That's because Europa's crust contains subduction zones, which drag oxidants deposited on the surface down into the ocean. It's theorized that a whole food chain could have evolved just below the ice of creatures that depend on this process. So it's possible the micro-swimmers will find some strange purple algae within moments of being deployed. And even if they don't, it hardly matters. With 48 to utilize, the cryobot could send out wave after wave of the robot at staggered time intervals, allowing each new swarm to hone in on different places. And the word swarm is deliberate, by the way. The idea is that the robots would swim together like a shoal of fish, reducing the chance of any false readings from one errant probe. And amazingly, they do all of this autonomously. It takes light, something in the region of 42 minutes, to travel from Jupiter to Earth, meaning any real-time commands sent to the micro-swimmers would only arrive after they'd run out of battery. That means they'd have to be capable of doing all of their exploring without any input from us. Nor is communication with Earth the only potential problem. Europa's gravity is about 14% of what we have on Earth. On the one hand, that's great, it means the pressures encountered tunneling down 25 kilometers aren't so crushing that the cryobot would fail. On the other, it presents a challenge for micro-swimmers, as Shayla told the American Society of Mechanical Engineers to quote, A lot of underwater robots now rely on having the center of buoyancy above the center of gravity to provide passive stability. When you have such low gravity, you don't actually get that benefit, so control and steering is extra tricky. While it seems likely that engineers will be able to overcome this problem, it does bring us neatly to our final and somewhat spiriting chapter. The chapter where we take this awesome sounding mission and try to analyze some of the ways that it could go horribly wrong. Back in spring of 2022, Dr. Sam Howell, the cryobot guy we mentioned earlier, sat down for a long interview with the Universe Today podcast to talk about a possible Europa Ocean mission. As part of that interview, he was invited to detail all the technical challenges his cryobot might one day face, and, well, there are a lot of them. To simplify things, we can break down the problems into two categories, protecting the probe and protecting Europa. Let's start with the probe itself. The whole time the cryobot is tunneling, and the whole time the micro swimmers are doing their thing, we will need to have a lander on the surface beaming data back to Earth. This is where things get tricky. Aside from the endless geological stresses, Europa's surface is also doused in intense radiation. How intense? Well, it's so intense that the upcoming Europa Clipper mission can't orbit the moon. Instead, it will conduct multiple flybys to stop all of its electronics from getting fried. Whatever lander we place on Europa will have to survive in this hostile environment for literal years, maintaining contact with Earth that entire time. And it's a big problem, one people are trying to solve creatively. One suggestion is that the lander itself could act as a melt probe after touchdown, melting itself, say, to 10 meters into the ice, equivalent to a depth of about 32 feet, which is easily enough to shield against Europa's radiation. But it highlights another potential problem. How do we even begin melting Europa's surface? Dr. Howell referred to this as the startup problem. That's because the theory of what happens once the cryobot is digging all works perfectly fine, as does landing the probe on the surface. But going from sat on the surface to tunneling down, well, 
that's a bit of a problem. With no atmosphere, the ice at Europa's surface might not turn to water once the melt probe starts, but instead sublimate, turning it straight into a gas. This would mess up the melt probe's plans, but there might be no way around it. Try and draw forcefully down for the first couple of meters, and Europa's gravity is so weak that pushing downwards might instead push the probe upwards and away from the surface. Still, perhaps none of these challenges compare to the greatest of them all, making sure we don't contaminate everything. As a world that may well be home to living creatures, Europa is at high risk of contamination from Earth origin spores or microbes. Remember uh, the end of War of the Worlds? When, 120 year old spoiler alert, here the marauding Martians are killed off after encountering Earth viruses that their systems are unprepared for. Well, there's a worry that we might wind up doing that to a bunch of alien dolphins for real. Or we may just wind up contaminating any area we touch down on so that we can't say for sure if the microorganisms we find there are extraterrestrial or if they originated at home. This is one of the major reasons why no craft are allowed to remain in the Jovian system after completing their missions, but they have to be crashed either into Jupiter or into one of the uninhabitable moons. We need to make sure that Europa remains pristine. And both meeting that goal while also getting to explore what lies beneath the ice is going to require a whole lot of serious science along with serious ethical debates. Even if the journey there would kill off most contaminants, even a 1% chance of something surviving could be too much. Still, we've no doubt that humanity is up to the challenge. Right now, in places like JPL, the next chapter in the story of human exploration is being written. A story that will soon become so epic that it'd give Demon Slayer a run for its money. Within the next 20 years, it's possible that we'll find ourselves about to send a probe out on a voyage that could change everything. A journey to an ocean untouched for billions of years. A journey that could rewrite our understanding of the entire cosmos.